To introduce myself, I'm Sonia, and I really appreciate you all coming to my talk and RailsConf for having me. And today I'm going to be talking about fixing flaky tests and also about how reading a lot of mystery novels helped me learn how to do that better. So I want to start out by telling you a story, and it's about the first flaky test that I ever had to deal with. It was back in my first year as a software engineer, and I'd worked really hard building out this very complicated form. It was my first big front-end feature. And so I wrote a lot of unit and feature tests to make sure that I didn't miss any edge cases. Everything was working pretty well, and we shipped it. But then a few days later, we started to have an issue. A test failed unexpectedly on our master branch. The failing test was one of the feature tests for my form. But nothing related to the form had changed and it went back to passing in the next build. The first time it came up, we all kind of ignored it. Tests fail randomly once in a while, and that's okay, right? <laughs> yeah, then it happened again, and again, and so I said, fine, okay, no problem. I will spend an afternoon digging into it, and I'll fix it, and we'll all move on. The only problem was I had never fixed a flaky test before, and I had no idea why a test would pass or fail on different runs. So I did what I often did when trying to debug problems that I didn't really understand. I started out by trying to use trial and error. So I made a random change, and then I ran the test over and over again to see if it would, it would still fail occasionally. And that kind of trial and error approach can work sometimes with normal bugs. Sometimes you even start using trial and error, and that leads you to a solution that helps you better understand the actual problem. Uh, but that didn't work at all with this flaky test. Trying a random fix, running it 50 times, it didn't actually prove to me that I had fixed it, and then a few days later, even with that fix, it still failed again. So I needed another approach. And that's exactly what makes fixing flaky tests so challenging. You really can't just try random fix, fixes and test them by running the test over and over again. It's a very slow feedback loop. We eventually figured out a fix for that flaky test, but not until several different people had tried random fixes that failed and it sucked up entire days of work. And the other thing I learned from this was that even just a few flaky tests can really slow down your team. When a test fails without actually signaling something wrong with the test suite, you not only have to rerun all of your tests before you're ready to deploy your code, which slows down the whole development process, you also lose a little bit of trust in your test suite. And eventually, you might even start ignoring real failures because you assume they're just flaky tests. So it's super important to learn how to fix flaky tests efficiently, and better yet, avoid writing them in the first place. For me, the real breakthrough in figuring out how to fix flaky tests was when I came up with a method. Instead of trying things randomly, I started by gathering all the information I could about the flaky tests and the times that it had failed. Then I used that information to try to fit it into one of the five main categories of flaky tests. We'll talk about what those are in a minute. And then based on that, I came up with a theory of what might be happening. Then, based on that theory, I would implement my fix. At the same time that I was figuring this out, I was on kind of a mystery novel binge. And it struck me that every time I was working on fixing a flaky test, I felt kind of like a detective solving a mystery. After all, the steps to do that at least in the novels I read, which are probably very different from real life, are basically starting with gathering evidence, then you identify suspects, you come up with a theory of means and motive, and then you can solve it. And so thinking about fixing flaky tests that way made it much more enjoyable and actually became kind of a fun challenge for me instead of just a frustrating and tedious problem that I had to deal with. So that's the framework I'm going to use in this talk for explaining how to fix flaky tests. Let's start with step one, gathering evidence. There are lots of pieces of information that can be helpful to have when you're trying to diagnose and fix a flaky test. Some of those include error messages and output for every time that you've seen it fail, the time of day those failures occurred, how often the test failing, is it failing every other time or just once in a blue moon, 
and which tests were run before the test when it failed and in what order. So how can you efficiently get all of this information? A method that I've used in the past and that has worked well is to have any time a test fails on your master branch or whatever branch you would not expect to see failures on because tests had to pass before merging into it, have any failures on that branch automatically sent to a bug tracker with all the metadata you'd need, such as a link to the CI build where they failed. I've had success doing this with Rollbar in the past, but I'm sure other bug trackers would work for this as well. And when doing that, it's important to make sure that the failures for the same test can generally be grouped together in the bug tracker. It might take a little bit of configuration or finessing to get this to work, but it's really helpful because then you're able to cross-reference between different occurrences of the same failure and figure out what's, what they have in common, which can help you understand why they're happening. All right, so now that we have our ev evidence, we can start looking for suspects. And with flaky tests, the nice thing is that there's basically always the same set of usual suspects to start with, and then you can narrow down from there. Those suspects are async code, order dependency, time, unordered collections, and randomness. So I'm gonna go through each of these one by one. I'm gonna talk through an example or two, how you might identify that a test fits into one of these particular categories, and then how you would go about fixing it based on that. So let's start with async code, which in my experience is often one of the biggest categories of flaky tests when testing Rails apps. When I say async code, I'm talking about tests in which some code runs asynchronously, which means that the events in the test can happen in more than one order. The most common way this comes up when you're testing Rails apps is in your system or feature tests. So most Rails apps use Capybara, either through Rails built-in system tests or RSpec feature tests to write end-to-end -end tests for the application that spin up a Rails server in a browser and then the test interacts with the app similar to the way an actual user would. And the reason you're necessarily dealing with async code and concurrency when you write Capybara tests is that there are at least three different threads involved. There's the main thread, executing your test code. There's another thread that Capybara spins off to run your Rails server. And then there's a separate process that's running the browser, which Capybara controls via a driver. So to make this a little more concrete, let's talk about a simple example. Imagine you have a Capybara test that clicks on a submit post button in a blog post form, and then it checks that that post is created in the database. Here's what the happy path for this test looks like in terms of the order of the events that occur within it. First, in your test code, we tell Capybara we want to click on that button. So in the browser, that triggers a click, which sends off an AJAX request to the Rails server, which creates a blog post in the database. When that request returns, it updates the UI, and then your test code checks the database and sees that the post is there. Everything works great. So the order of events in the browser and server timeline here is pretty predictable, provided you're not optimistically updating the UI before the request that created the blog post returns. And that's one reason why you could, should avoid optimistic updates if you can, because they can create a, both a flaky test and a flaky user experience. But the events in the test code timeline on the top here are less predictable in terms of where they happen in relation to the other ones. So one problematic ordering would be if right after we click on submit post, the test code, it can move right along to check the database and it happens to get to the database before the browser and the test rail server have finished going through the process that creates that blog post. So then we'll check the database, we won't see anything there and the test will fail. The fix here is relatively simple. We just need to make sure that we wait until the request has finished before we try to check for anything in the database. And we can do this by adding one of Capybara's waiting finders, like have content, which will look for something on the page and then retry until it shows up up to a certain timeout. So basically it'll check the page to see if post created is on it. If it's not there, it'll wait for a second and then check again until it sees it there. And only then will it be able to move on to the next line of code where we check for the post in the database. So with that code implemented, this is what the timeline looks like. Have content will block us from moving forward until the rest of the process has finished. So that's a relatively simple async flake and probably something that you've dealt with if you've written some capybara tests. But they can get a lot more complicated and sneaky. So let's look at another example. Here we have a test which goes to a page with a list of books, clicks on a sort button, waits for the books to show up in that sorted order using one of capybara's waiting finders, 
then clicks again to reverse that order and waits for the order to show up again. So provided expect alphabetical order and expect reverse alphabetical order are both using those same waiting finders I was talking about that will retry until things show up in the right place, it seems like this should work well. We're waiting in between each thing that we do, but it is possible for this to be flaky. The way that that could happen is if when we visit the books path, the books happen to already be sorted. So then when we click on sort and expect the alphabetical order, that expect alphabetical order line is no longer actually waiting or blocking anything for us. We can, it passes immediately when we move on to the next click. So both of those clicks can actually happen before we reloaded the page for the first time with the books in alphabetical order. It just kind of acts like a double click. And as a result, we can end up with the test never getting to the state of being in a reverse alphabetical order. The fix here is actually fairly similar to the last one. We just need to add some more specific waiting finders to make sure that we don't move on through our test code too quickly. So in this case, we might look for something on the page that indicates the request has actually finished beyond the fact that the books are in order. Then we can safely move on to the next step. So if you're looking at a given flaky test and you're trying to figure out whether it might belong to this async code category, the first question I usually look at is, is it a system or feature test, something that uses Capybara or some other way of interacting with the browser, since that's the number one place where these show up. It is possible that you have other areas in your code base where you're dealing with async code, but this is generally the biggest one. And then within that, does it trigger any events without explicitly rating for the results? Even in a place where it looks relatively innocent, it's always a good idea to make sure that you're behaving like a real user would and waiting in between each thing you do to see the result. When you're trying to identify whether the flake is due to some async code, it can also be helpful to use Capybara's ability to save screenshots, uh, which you can use by just calling save screenshot directly, provided you're using one of the drivers that supports that, or the Capybara screenshot gem, which helps you wrap your tests in a, uh, so that every time they fail, you'll capture a screenshot of the end state of the test. When you're looking to prevent async flakes, there's a few things to keep in mind. First, as I mentioned, make sure your test is waiting for each action within it to finish. And when you're doing this, make sure you're not using sleep or waiting for some arbitrary amount of time. It's important to wait for something specific. And that's because if you wait for an arbitrary amount of time, at some point, your code will just happen to be running slowly enough that that arbitrary amount of time isn't long enough and it'll flake again. It also means that you might be waiting longer than you need to in a lot of other cases because the process happened faster. And so by waiting for something specific, you can avoid both of those pitfalls. It's also important to understand Capybara's API, which methods wait and which don't. So everything based on find will generally wait, but there are a few uh, certain things like all that don't wait in the same way. And so it's just very important to be familiar with uh, all of Capybara's docs and how to use its tools correctly. Finally, it's important to check that each assertion you're making in the test is working as you expect it to. It's very easy to write assertions that look like they're uh, doing the correct waiting behavior, but actually don't, as we saw in that double click example. Sometimes content is already on the page in a different place, and it allows kind of accidental success. All right, so let's move on to our next suspect, order dependency. Define, I define this category of tests as any that can pass or fail based on which tests ran before them. Usually, this is caused by some sort of state leaking between tests. So when the state in another test, when, when the state another test creates is present or not present, it can cause the flaky test to fail. And there are a few potential areas where a shared state can happen in your tests. One is the database. Another is global or class variables, if those are modified within your tests. And then there's also the browser. Typically, one of the biggest issues with Rails apps is database state, so let's talk about that a little more in depth. When you're writing tests, each test should start with a clean database. That might not mean a fully empty database, but any, if anything is created, updated, or deleted in the database during a single test, it should be put back the way it was at the beginning. I kind of think of it like leave no trace when you're camping. Uh, 
So this is important because otherwise, those changes to the database could have unexpected impacts in later tests or create dependencies between tests so that you can't remove or reorder tests without risking cascading failures. There are several different ways to handle clearing your database state. Wrapping your test in a transaction and rolling it back after the test is generally the fastest way to clear your database, and it's the default for tests in Rails. But in the past, you couldn't use transactions with Capybara because the test code and the test server didn't share a database connection, so they were running in separate transactions and couldn't see the data in each other's transactions. Rails 5 system tests actually address this by allowing shared access to database connections and tests so they could look at data within the same transaction. However, running in transactions can still have some subtle differences from normal behavior of your app, and so there may be reasons why you still don't want to use them as your cleanup method. For example, if you have any after commit hooks set up on your models that only run when a transaction commits, those probably won't run if you're using transactional cleanup. So if you're not using transactional cleanup, another option is the database cleaner gem, which can clean with either truncating tables or using a delete from statement on them. And this is generally slower than transactional, but it is a little bit more realistic in terms of you're not having an additional transaction wrapped around everything that's happening in your tests. And the important thing to make sure if you're using this method is that this database cleanup is running after Capybara's cleanup. So Capybara does some work to make sure that the browser state is cleared and settled between each test, including wait, waiting for any AJAX requests to resolve. And if you clean your database before that cleanup and waiting happens, those AJAX requests could create some data that doesn't get cleaned up. So there's a bit of an ordering issue here. And you can avoid it if you're using RSpec by putting your database cleaner call in an append after block. So why do I tell you all of this? The thing about database cleaning is it should just work, and it often does, especially if you're just using Rails basic built-in transactional cleaning. But there are a lot of different ways that you could have your Rails app and test suite configured, and it is possible to do it in such a way that certain gotchas are introduced. So it's important to know how your database cleaner works, when it runs, and if there's anything it's leaving behind, especially if you're starting to deal with flaky tests that seem to be order dependent. Let's look at an example of this. Let's say we're using database cleaner with the truncation strategy. Maybe we started doing that back before Rails 5 let us share a database connection and it's stuck. Maybe we don't want any weirdness around transactions, one of those reasons. But we notice this is slow, so somebody comes in to optimize the test suite a little bit. And they notice that we're creating book genres uh, in almost all of the tests. They decide to create those genres before the entire test suite runs and then exclude them from the database cleaner. So this will speed up our tests a bit, but it does introduce a gap in our cleaning. If we make any kind of modification to book genre, since we're using truncation to clean the database instead of transactions, that update won't be undone between tests. And this could potentially affect later tests and show up as an order dependent flake. To be clear, I'm not picking on database cleaner here. I just want to give an example of how a minor configuration change could allow you to create more flakes and why it's important to have a good understanding of how cleaning is actually working in your test suite and the trade-offs you might introduce depending on how you do it. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are some other possible sources of order dependency via shared state. One is the browser. Since tests run within the same browser, that can contain specific state depending on which test just ran. Capybara works pretty hard to clean all of this up before it moves on to the next test, so this should usually be taken care of for you. But it is possible, again, depending on your configuration, how you have everything set up, that maybe there's something that sneaks through. And so it's good to be aware of that as a possible place where shared state could be. Another is global and class variables, as I mentioned. If you modify those, they could persist from one test to the next. Normally, Ruby will yell at you if you reassign a global variable, but one area where these can kind of sneak in is if you have a hash assigned to a global variable and you just change one of the values within it. Since that isn't reassigning the entire variable, it won't come up as a warning. All right, so if you're looking at a particular test and you're trying to figure out why, wh whether it's being caused by order dependency, there's a couple different strategies you can use. One is just to start out by trying to replicate the failure with the same set of tests in the same order. So if you can take a look at how it ran in your CI or wherever you saw it fail and run the exact same set of tests together with the same seed value to put them in the same order uh, and it fails every time you do that, then you have a sense that this is probably an order dependent test. 
but at that point you still don't know which tests are affecting each other. So to figure that out, you're probably going to want to cross-reference each time you've seen it failed and see if the same tests were running before that failure. Our spec has a built-in bisect tool that you can also use to help narrow down the set of tests to the one that produced the dependency. However, you may find that it, it can run a bit slowly depending on how fast your test suite runs, so sometimes it's easier to just look at things manually. In order to prevent order dependency, you should make sure that you've configured your test suite to run in random order. This might seem kind of counterintuitive, but the goal is that to surface order dependent tests quickly, not just when you add or remove or move around a certain test. Running in random order is the default in many tests and is configurable in RSpec. Also, make sure you spend some time understanding your entire test setup and teardown process and work to close any gaps where shared state might be leaking through from one test to another. All right, moving on to our next suspect, time. This is probably the one that gives me the most headaches. This category includes any test that can pass or fail depending on the time of day that it is run. So let's start with an example here. Imagine we have this code that runs in a before save hook on our task model. It sets an automatic due date to the next day at the end of the day if a due date isn't already specified. Then we write this test. We create a task with no due date specified and we check that it's when we expect it to be, the current date plus one at the end of the day. Seems like it should be fine. But this test actually starts failing after 7 p.m. every night, very strangely. And how could that possibly be happening? The trouble is, we're using two slightly different ways of calculating tomorrow here. Date.tomorrow uses the time based on the time zone we set for our Rails app, while date.today plus one will be based on the system time. So if the system time is in UTC and our Rails app's time zone is EST, they'll be five hours apart, and after 7 p.m., there'll be different days, which results in this failure. So how can we avoid this? One easy fix would be just to use date.current, which respects time zone, instead of date.today. Another option would be to use the time cop gem, which basically allows you to freeze time by mocking out what Ruby's sense of time is. And so with time cop, we can freeze time. Here it would be January 1st at 10 a.m. And then our expected due date can just be a static value, January 2nd at 11.59 p.m. And we can check that the due date is that exact value. This can be kind of helpful for making your tests a little bit more explicit and, ha and simpler so that they don't contain complicated logic that it itself needs to be tested. When you're trying to determine whether a given flaky test is time-based, the first obvious thing to do is to look for any references to date or time in the code under test. If you have a record of past failures, you can also check whether they've all happened around the same time of day. And finally, if you suspect it's time-based, you can add time cop to that spec just temporarily to set it to the time of day where you've seen it fail before and see if it fails every time when you do that. As we saw in our example, using time cop to freeze time can make it easier to write reliable tests that deal with time and also easier to understand exactly what you're testing. Another strategy that you can use to surface time-based flakes is to set up your test suite so that it wraps every test in timecop.travel, time mocking the time to a different random time of day on each run of the suite that's printed out before the test runs. So this might seem a little crazy, but it's actually very helpful for surfacing tests that would normally only fail after business hours when nobody happens to be running the test suite so that you see them during the normal business day instead of at midnight when you just got woken up on call and you're trying to desperately <laughs> ship a deploy and the test suite keeps failing unexpectedly. It's just important to make sure that you're printing out the time of day that each test is running at and that you're able to then rerun the test with that same time of day so that later, if you're debugging a failure, you can easily replicate it. All right, our next suspect is unordered collections. This is a relatively simpler one. This is just any test that can pass or fail depending on the order of a set of items that's within it that doesn't have a pre-specified order. So let's look at an example here. We have a test where we're looking at a set of active posts and we expect them to equal some specific posts that perhaps we've created earlier in the test. The issue with this test is that the database query in the first line doesn't have a specific order. 
So even though things will often be returned from the database in the same order just by chance, there's no guarantee that this will actually always happen. And when it doesn't, this test will fail. So the fix is just to make sure that we're specifying an order on the items returned by the database and that also our expected posts are in that exact same order. When trying to identify whether a, a flaky test is being caused by unordered collections, look for any assertions about the order of an array, the contents of an array, or the first or last item in one. If you're using RSpec, uh, you can use the match array uh, expectation, which allows you to basically just assert things about what's in an array without caring about the order, or you can just add an explicit sort to both the expectations and what you're looking at. All right, so we've gotten to our last possible suspect, which is randomness. And you might think that all of these different categories of flaky tests have something to do with randomness since they're randomly failing. But in this case, I'm talking about tests that actually explicitly invoke randomness via a random number generator. So here's an example of a test data factory that uses FactoryBot to create an event. If we have a validation that enforces start date, uh, sorry, and suppose we might start out with just having start date and then adding end date after that at some point, and we decide, okay, start date will be sometime five days from now, end date will be sometime 10 days from now, we could run into an issue where end date actually ends up being lower than start date since they're both random values. So if we add a validation to events that enforces that at some, some percentage of time, uh, our tests that deal with events will fail because they'll have invalid data. So in this case, you're just better off being explicit and creating the same dates every time. And this might feel a little counterintuitive because randomness can seem useful as a tool for testing a large um, spectrum of different types of data and so on, but there is a big downside in not being able to know what your tests are actually testing and having them be flaky. And so a better strategy is to, um, is to actually just write tests for each of those specific cases that you would like to test. So if you're trying to identify whether randomness is causing your flake, the first obvious thing to do, obviously, is to look for a random number generator, and often this will come up in your factories or fixtures. Uh, but another thing you can try is using the dash dash seed option in uh, either mini test or RSpec, and that will allow you to run the test with the same seed value for, for randomness and generally the same random values produced. With RSpec, you just want to make sure that you actually have kernel.sran set to RSpec's config seed so that, those, so that passing the seed option will actually control the randomness seed. To prevent randomness-based flakes, as I mentioned, the general strategy is to remove randomness from your tests and ex instead explicitly test the boundaries and edge cases that you're interested in. It's also generally a good idea to avoid gems like Faker to generate data for tests. They're very useful for generating realistic seeming data in your dev environment, but in your tests, at least from my perspective, it's more important to have reliable behavior than random and realistic data. All right, so now we've looked at all of the usual suspects, so we can move on to forming a theory and actually solving a flaky test mystery. My first strategy tip when trying to find a fix to a flaky test and there isn't an obvious one popping out for you is just to run through each of those categories that I've described and look for any connection or identifying signs that could link this test to one of those. So even if it looks perfectly fine but it is dealing with a date, maybe dig in down that particular path. And again, just resist the urge to use trial and error to test fixes. It's more important to form a strong theory about how this might be happening first, even if you're not 100% sure it's going to work a lot better than using trial and error. What you can do, and what might involve a little bit of a different kind of trial and error, is trying to find a way to reliably replicate failures to prove your theory. So this came up a little bit with uh, when I was talking about randomness, dates, and order dependency, because for those you have more control over the factors that might be producing the flake. You can freeze time, you can run the tests in the same order, you can use the same random seed, and then potentially be able to replicate the failure. And since most flaky tests 
typically are flaking very infrequently and passing most of the time, if you're able to get them to fail two or three times in a row, you can be pretty confident that you've replicated it versus the other direction when you're using trial and error to test a fix and you're seeing it pass. It takes a lot of runs to be confident that that's actually what you're seeing. So you might try all those methods and still be stuck. Flaky tests are hard. Uh, one strategy you can try if you get to that situation is adding some code that will give you more information the next time it fails. So if you've got like a hunch that something's off, like perhaps with what's in the database or you're curious about what the value, value of a certain variable is, add that to something that will be logged out in the test and then the next time that it fails in CI, you can take a look at that and factor that into your process of fixing it. Another strategy that I really like is pairing with another developer. Since fixing flaky tests is so much about your having a deep understanding of your testing tools, your framework, and your own code, everybody is going to have some gaps. But when you have two people working together, you can fill each other's gaps in a little bit. And you can also help keep each other from going down rabbit holes or getting too frustrated uh, chasing down the same wrong theory. Another question I see coming up a lot at this point is, can I just delete it? I can't fix it, it keeps failing, is it even worth it anymore? Why did I become a developer, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and my first response to this is that you have to accept that if you're writing tests, at some point, inevitably, you are going to have to deal with flaky ones. You can't just delete any test that starts to be flaky because you'll end up making significant compromises in the coverage that you have for your app. And also, learning to fix and avoid flaky tests is a skill that you can develop over time. And it's one that's really worth investing in, even if that means, means <laughs> spend, spending two days fixing one instead of just deleting it. That being said, when I'm dealing with flaky tests, I do like to take a step back and think about the test coverage I have for a feature holistically. What situations do I have coverage for? Which ones am I maybe neglecting or ignoring? And what are the stakes of having the kind of bug that might slip through the cracks in my coverage? If the flaky test I'm looking at is for a very small edge case with low stakes, or it's something that's actually well covered by other tests or could be covered by a different type of test, maybe it does make sense to delete it or replace it. And this ties into a bigger picture idea, which is that when we're writing tests, we're always making trade-offs between realism and maintainability. Using automated tests instead of manual Q QA is itself a trade-off in terms of substituting in a machine to do the testing for us, which is going to behave differently than an actual user would. But it's worth it in a lot of situations because we can get results faster and consistently and we can add tests as we code. So different types of tests will go to different lengths to mimic real life, and generally the most realistic ones are the ones that are hardest to maintain and keep from getting flaky. There's an idea of the test pyramid, which I think was first came up with by Mike Cohn, though I think there's been many other spins on it since. And this is my particular spin. You should have a strong foundation of lots of unit tests on the bottom. They're simpler, they're faster, and they're less likely to be flaky. And then as you go from less realistic tests to more realistic tests, you should have fewer of those types of tests because they are going to take more effort to maintain. And the tests themselves are coarser grain, so they're testing a lot more, covering a lot more situations. And the, these more realistic tests are just, in general, more likely to become flaky because there's so many more moving parts involved. So it's wise to keep the number of them in your test suite in balance, test the major happy paths, the major problems, but leave uh, certain edge cases and other types of testing for uh, more specific and isolated tests. The last thing I wanna talk about is how to work with the rest of your team to fix flaky tests. It shouldn't be just a solo effort. Since flaky tests can slow everyone down and erode everyone's trust in your test suite, they should be a really high priority to fix. If you can manage it, they should potentially even be the next highest priority under production fires. This needs to be something that you talk about as a team, that you communicate to your new hires, and that you all agree it's worth investing time in to keep each other moving quickly and trusting your test suite. The next thing I recommend is that making sure you have a specific person assigned to each active flake. That person is in charge of looking for a fix, deciding whether maybe you need to temporarily disable the test while, they, while it's being worked on, if it's frequently flaking. That person should reach out to others for help if they're stuck, and so on. And it's important to make sure that responsibility is spread out among your entire team. 
don't just let one person end up being the flake master and everybody else ignores them. <laughs> if you're already sending flakes to a bug tracker, as I suggested in the gathering evidence section, you can use that as a place to assign them uh, to different people. The next thing I recommend is setting a target for your master branch pass rate and tracking it week over week. So for example, you could say that you want to have builds on your master branch pass 90% of the time. And then by tracking this, that helps you keep an eye on whether you're progressing towards that goal and course correct if your efforts aren't working and you need to invest more in it or if you have kind of wider issues with your test suite's reliability. To wrap this all up, if you rec remember just one thing from my talk, I hope it's that flaky tests don't have to just be an annoying and frustrating problem or something you try to ignore as much as you can. Fixing them can actually be an opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of your tools and your code, and also to pretend you're a detective for a little while. So hopefully this talk has made it easier for you to do that. Thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to, I'll be up here and you can come up and ask me afterwards. Thanks.